I suspect we've all seen it, this uh, chart of beef, right, where, where the various cuts come from. When I was in culinary school, I had a, the distinct pleasure of having Chef Siebold for butcher class. And he's old school European, serious guy. And uh, he, had, um, he had his scabbard with knives in it. And uh, his hands would go in a certain way and the meat would just sort of fall apart. And so it was always a, a, a thing that we were looking for to get a hold of his knife. And, and when you did, it was, it was like um, getting a hold of Yoda's lightsaber. You know, I mean, it was like so sharp. But one thing I really did notice about that was it did a lot more in his hands than it did in mine. So it wasn't only that his knives were sharp. Look at that. I'm like freaking pro here. Um, it was also the way that he used them. And so the art of butchery um, with 40 plus years experience at that point in his life um, is, is really something that you have in your hands, in your, in your muscles, in your knives that is really important for us to take a moment just to understand that there is mastery in all of this and how that reflects to us when it comes time for us to have animals cut up into various cuts, there's an art of mastery in farming that gets that animal to that point. And then there's an art of mastery in butchery that brings that animal to the next level so that your customers have a great experience with that meat. And I, I imagine that most of you raise animals, and I imagine that most of you have your animals cut at the slaughterhouse, and you're filling out a cut sheet. And I've seen a hundred different cut sheets, and I've filled out as many. And I think the most important thing I can tell you here is to really pay attention to the way you fill that cut sheet out and give really clear instructions, because the guy that because you don't actually get FaceTime with that guy that's cutting the meat, unless you ask for it. If you really uh, get into the, the, the a, a conversation relationship with the people that own the slaughterhouse, then you can get into conversation with, uh, with the actual butcher. Now, I ran, I owned and ran a, a retail butcher shop in, in Massachusetts. Um, I, I, I closed it a little while ago be, for a variety of reasons, but um, we had an opportunity to have direct contact with customers, and I suspect that while you probably have a similar opportunity, it isn't quite the same um, experience. They're coming to your farm, they're buying either frozen beef or, or a kit, a box of beef, or a, a set amount, some sort of a CIA. Uh, uh, a, a community supported agriculture um, uh, arrangement. But I think what's really important is that, that largely the job of a butcher is to make a beautiful presentation, is to set a beautiful case. And we, you know, we've heard all of the terms that um, can be used, you know, um, stack it high and watch it fly is one that the butcher industry likes to use, like fill, really fill that case up. And sometimes it's, you know, just add some green, some parsley sprigs and some kale because you're going to make the colors pop. And really it starts with, in our case, presenting a really great quality product and having some expertise and know-how as to, as to what we're going to say when the customer asks for something that we don't have. Because we're a whole animal butcher shop, we run out of stuff. You get a steer at 700 pounds, you only got so much rib and loin and tender. And when those are gone, you have to have an alternative. You have to have something to sell those customers because you can't get them in the door. You paid a ton of money to get them to walk in the door the first time. And then if the answer that you give them is we don't have that and they walk out without it, 
you, you, you're probably not going to get them to come back in. And so this is about marketing and communication and, and giving people a, a, an alternative, and that is going to take some skill. It was easy for me because I'm a chef. I have a background in cooking. I know how to prepare other things. I can give people an alternative that's going to actually probably be more interesting than the, what they came into the store to get in the first place. But it does, it does take some effort. So here you are standing at your farm store and you're at your farmer's market in that scenario and I'm out of ribeyes, what do you do? What's your next cut? And you've had this conversation, I can, I can imagine. And so what I really got clear about was that along with being a farmer, along with being uh, all, uh, all of the things that are required to, to run that business, you also have to be an expert at marketing. And, and, and what I got from this, <laughs> between this morning's session and now is that you probably aren't experts at, at marketing and that, that there are people out there and I just want to make sure that, that um, what, I, what I communicate here is that it's incredibly important to make those packages look really great and have a really good, concise, clear label that says what's in it and, and make the sound of those names really enticing. So it isn't just, um, you know, beef plate beef plate, or uh, the example we had this morning was flycatcher steak. Like, what, what is a flycatcher steak, and, and who wants to actually order that and, and, and buy that and take it home? <laughs> hmm, you know, that's so, um, you know, let's, let's uh, really pay attention. You know, the entire world has been cutting meat since the, in, since the invention of the knife. So there's a lot of names for a lot of different cuts. There's a lot of different ways to cut that, to break down an animal. We can, we can really utilize history. We can get back into, um, into the way things have been done and, and, and learn. We've lost the, the art, the mastery of butchery. You know, boxed beef, going to the grocery store doesn't allow people to have a, a mastery and art of butchery. It's just steak, 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 and the rest of it is ground somewhere else. But, there, but there, there's a huge history, a long history of butchers and, and butcher apprentices um, in this country and others. And I think, I hope, my hope is that it's coming back, that we can bring it back. And, and what that's going to mean ultimately is that the young people that are getting into this line of work that are enticed by, yeah, I, I, I am just, I, I'm sort of offended by the notion of rock star butcher, but it's there. And, and um, you know, these young kids are into it, the rock star butcher, and they, they got their tattoos. I don't have any. Uh, but they do, and hey, you know, look, if you want to tattoo the diagram of a beef on your forearm, go for it. But I don't think it actually makes you a skilled butcher. Um, that's going to actually take some time at the bench with a knife and a guy that you're watching cut meat, and you're going to be trimming his trim for a while. And I'm going to encourage the young people interested in getting into butchery to really make the most of that time. A, he's going to say some, some funny stuff. Like, it's, it's going to be amusing. And you're going to learn a ton. There is a way to do it. And the way he does it is the way he does it because it's the right way to do it. Pay attention, watch it, and, and, and get it right. And don't, you know, uh, and don't jump ahead. I have had over the past six years of running my shop so much opportunity for these kids to come in that literally think they're butchers and they have no idea. First and foremost, what it means to clean a dish. And that's really disappointing. I really want them to st just get into the dish pit. Let's get the floor clean. Let's start from the bottom and work our way up. And then in reality, at the end of the day, we're going to start at the top and work our way down. <laughs> And that's how we're going to clean the shop every day. And so um, starting with ultimately how to communicate 
with your butcher. And your butcher is, I've met a lot of them. I've worked with a lot of them in the Northeast. Um, they're, they're interesting folks. Um, they have a roughness about them. Um, all, they, they wear incredibly heavy boots. Sometimes I think if you knocked them over, they would just pop right back up. Um, but I think they ultimately uh, want to do the right thing and meanwhile. So, so what I want to help you create is a, is, is a, a way of connecting to those people. And so um, it's going to take something and it's going to take some learning on your part to really start to understand what, is, uh, what you're asking for. And so if we take this animal here and we look at the, at the neck, you know, there's a, there's a neck roll. Oftentimes it's a, a spoon roast. It's sold as, um, uh, as a chuck roll. Um, and so we had a, a young man in here, a, a question came up about a chuck roast, a bone-in chuck roast. And that came from his, his butcher out in wherever he's from. And uh, I'm like, I don't know how you make a bone-in chuck roast. That doesn't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Like those neck bones that are in, the, that are in that part of the chuck, don't make any, it wouldn't make any sense to me to have a bone-in chuck roast. So, you know, the... the um, the shoulder clod is going to come off. This diagram shows the shoulder clod exactly where I would put the brisket. So that's uh, it's probably not entirely correct because they put the brisket down on where I would put the belly. So we should find a different diagram because this one looks like it's uh, more for for art than fact. Um, the uh, and in the chuck you have some really fun. You have some really fun stuff. Um, the flat iron is in there. How are you going to communicate to your butcher at the slaughterhouse to get the flat iron out and either, either trim it into feather steaks or trim it into a flat iron steak? Because you want it. It's valuable. Your customers are going to want it. And then, we have to, and then there's, a, there's a petite tender in there. And, uh, uh, and that, those are pretty much the higher end cuts that you can get out of there. And then depending on your situation, are you going to make the decision to take those unusual cuts and put them at a premium price, or are you going to take those unusual cuts and put them at a extremely fair price? What that does is gets them all out of your inventory. And so you take that petite tender that comes out of the chuck, which is very tender, it is the mock tender oftentimes called, it's the... Um, and you can, you can do one of two things. And we at my shop did both of these. Um, the first thing we did is we priced them really high. We're like there's only two pounds for every 700 pounds of beef. So we're going to make it $30 a pound. It's going to be ridiculous. And then my butcher said, you know, at that price, they sort of sit there and they sort of take away from some other stuff that you have going on that is actually going to make you some money. So let's, let's price them at $14 a pound move them out of here and then focus on getting what we make money on out of the door. You make a few customers happy and you get your case to look more consistent. So we tried that model and I can't really say which one worked better for us. It's just two different approaches to, to those, um, to, the, to that tiny percentage of that carcass that is those cuts. Um, you know, it's, it's it, it, like in the knuckle, there's a steak called a Merlot steak. And, you know, if you're in um, a processing facility, you might not want to take the time to get that out of the knuckle. It's a very tender steak. It's got lovely flavor most of the time. It's, um, but it does take some time to harvest. So you get the knuckle, it comes off the round, and you, depending on if it's left or right, you take that side of the knuckle off, you trim it out, and it's a it's a, a pound and a quarter roughly, of merlot steak. It's got uh, muscle uh, groups that are very um, tight and and short, so it tends to be a fairly well eating steak. Um, so communicating that to your butcher at at your slaughterhouse could be 
um, it, it could take some finesse. And, and do you want to? Is it worth anything to you? Do you want it to, is it worth just putting that knuckle in the grinder, getting your pound packages or two pound packages back and getting those labeled in the freezer? So those are some choices that you have to make. Um, you know, there's a, in the, in the belly next to the flank is a steak called a, a vacio. The vacio is sort of like a, it's got, it's sort of like a hanger skirt. It's in that category. It's got long, sort of muscle groups that are, the, the muscles themselves are very long. It's got a round end and it's sort of a fingered uh, fringe. Uh, it's one of my favorite steaks, but it's not a steak that you typically see. And it's probably a good one for you guys to focus on getting out because on a 700 pound steer, you can get probably eight to 10 pounds of, of vacio. And, it, and it, it is, it, like I said, it's one of my favorites. And, Oftentimes that steak goes in the grinder, and so that's sort of a missed opportunity. Um, uh, what, what's it called? I don't hear well. Uh, with a V? Yeah, vacio. Where do you say that came from? It comes, it's next to the flank, so on the belly, comes down here. Inside the skirt, I, here I go with my, using me as the example again. So the, the skirt steak sits inside the diaphragm and actually makes the diaphragm do its thing. The vacio sits in the layer of fat in the belly flap. And the, the, it's near the flank, and so you get the, what we call the flap, which is, you know, un, an unfortunate name, but it's, uh, it's sort of an unyielding piece of fat and connective tissue, and so it would be skin and belly on one side, and then stomach cavity on the, on the other side. And you sort of peel apart the layers, and then this beautiful steak appears out of it. It takes some skill, it takes some time, but it's, um, it's and it's, it, it's got some chew to it. And so, you know, I always enjoyed that conversation with our customers. It's like, you're gonna need to chew this. Like, this is gonna take something for you to eat, but it's gonna taste amazing and it's gonna have a great mouthfeel. It's just gonna, it's a real steak, you know? So, I always enjoyed that. So, you know, the art of butchery, thank you. Thank, thank you all.